You're listening to the Vox Media Podcast Network. This is What the Heck with Mike Heck on MMAfighting.com. Now, here is your host, Mike Heck. What the heck? Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of What the Heck here on MMAfighting.com. I am Mike Heck. Thanks for checking out the show once again this week. Back from my first road trip covering an event in around a year and a half or so. It's out on the road covering Bellator 258 at Mohegan Sun. And man, it was a great event. It really was quite good. Sergio Pettis becomes the new Bellator Bantamweight champion. Great performance against Juan Archuleta. Unanimous decision victory. I scored the fight 49-46, but I had absolutely no issue with the 50-45 scorecard. So kudos to Sergio Pettis on his first major title. What a performance from the little brother of former UFC lightweight champion Anthony Pettis, who was there. And I mean, I got to tell you, I was in the back while Sergio was doing his post-fight scrum and everything. Anthony Pettis was just the proudest big brother I've ever seen. He was calling everybody on the phone, FaceTiming everybody. He was just so happy and... It was really fun to watch. Really fun to watch. The family coming through in a big way. Co-main event, we saw the return of Anthony Rumble Johnson, his first fight in a little over four years. Got the knockout win over Jose Augusto and wasn't without some some problems along the way. What a wild fight that was, that first round. Both guys were hurt. Augusto clearly had a hand injury and he's basically fighting two-thirds of that fight with one hand. And he almost finished Rumble Johnson in the first round, but Rumble eventually was able to get his wits to him and in the second round just delivered a piston to drop Augusto. Finally got the finish in round two. He was not happy about that performance. Scott Coker thought he was being a little too hard on himself. He was out for four years, so it is what it is. Before that, Peter Queeley got a big win over Patricky Pitbull. It was a doctor stoppage win due to a cut. I thought personally he was stopped a little too soon, but... Nonetheless, big win for the teammate of one Conor McGregor. Of course, James Gallagher was in his corner and the whole freaking card was calling him out. How about MVP? Michael Venom Page, that was some showing against Derek Anderson. Just looked sensational on his feet, shattered his nose with just a vicious head kick. I was in the arena watching that happen. I spent a lot of time in the back because we were doing so many post-fight interviews, but when that kick landed, it was like, oof. Especially in that kind of a setting, it was wild. But the fight was stopped between the first and second rounds. And now, it appears Scott Coker is lining him up to fight the winner between Lima and Amasov next month for the welterweight title. So, great event. I mean, the prelims are great and a lot of fun as well. Another big win for Rafion Stotts. He is a title contender for sure. Another title contender at 135, Patchy Mix. Had a great win over Albert Morales. He looked phenomenal, even though he said he had one of the hardest weight cuts of his career. Didn't really show. Kind of had a battle back through a little bit of adversity in the first round, but he looked sensational the rest of the way to get a submission win. Eric Perez gets his first Bellator win. How about Johnny Campbell scoring the big upset with the submission win over Henry Corrales? Like I said, a lot to like with this Bellator card. They're off this weekend, but back next weekend for Bellator 259. That event headlined by the featherweight title fight between Chris Cyborg and Leslie Smith. And the UFC, of course, was back at the Apex on Saturday. Big win for Marina Rodriguez over Michelle Watterson in the five-round main event. Big things are coming for her. Where she goes in this division, how much of a leap she'll get, not really too sure, but definitely somebody to keep an eye on in this loaded 115-pound division. Alex Morono, biggest win of his career. He stopped Donald Cerrone in the first round of the co-main event. Huge win for him, and it was was a pretty good night for the UFC. But now it's on to Houston, Texas, UFC 262 this Saturday, where hopefully a new lightweight champion of the world will be crowned as Charles Oliveira takes on Michael Chandler for the title that was vacated by the now retired Habib Nurmagomedov. Tony Ferguson versus Benil Dariush is the new co-main event. Now that we lost Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz, that is now taking place at UFC 263. And earlier this week, so you'll hear this on Tuesday, so on Monday, we did lose one fight from that main card on Saturday. Jack Hermanson and Edmund Shabazian will take place next Saturday. I believe will be the co-main event for that card, headlined by Rob Font and Cody Garbrandt. Uh, no real reason given why, but 
It's just not happening this Saturday. It's a little bit of a blow, but the card's still pretty fun nonetheless. But Jose Young's, I believe, is in Houston as we speak, and we will have all sorts of coverage for you throughout the week. But let's get to this show. Let's run down the lineup for what the heck and get to our first guest. We're going to wrap things up with Dustin Jacoby. He had that pretty wild fight with Iwan Kutalaba a little less than two weeks ago. That fight was scored a, a split draw. He was not very happy with that. And you will hear all about it as we wrap up the program this week. On Saturday, after the Bellator event, woke up, ate some breakfast, got on the road, had the chance to visit the folks at the New England cartel. Big thank you to Tyson Chartier for allowing that to happen. But we got some good stuff with Rob Font ahead of that fight with Cody Garbrandt. But I also got the chance for a few minutes to speak with Calvin Cater. It's the first time him and I have had the chance to speak since his loss to Max Holloway. I think it's the second time him and I have had the chance to speak one-on-one -on -one in person. The first time was UFC 220, that media day, before he knocked out Shane Burgos in the third round of that crazy fight. But you'll hear that chat with Calvin Cater. It's a little less than 10 minutes, but it's great to catch up with the Boston finisher. The aforementioned Alex Morono will join us to recap his big win over Cowboy Cerrone on Saturday. But first, there's just no other way to kick this off. We go to a man who has become one of, if not... My absolute favorite fighter to interview over the last year or so. He is back June 12th, the rematch for the flyweight title against Davison Figueiredo at UFC 263 in Glendale, Arizona. I will uh, just preface this by saying I was in quarantine on Wednesday at Mohegan Sun covering the Bellator event for a long time. So I was in my hotel room, locked away, but luckily had the chance to speak with this man. You'll hear that right now one Brandon Moreno. All right, so here in beautiful Uncasville, Connecticut is where I sit right now. Let us say hello to one of our favorites on the show, just making the funniest faces on earth. He'll be uh, back at it June 12th, UFC 263 in Glendale, Arizona, and he will challenge Davis and Figueredo for the UFC flyweight title in a rematch from their absolute barn burner in December that was scored a draw. So excited for this fight and so excited to have Brandon Moreno back on the show. How are you, my friend? Hey, what the heck with my heck? Hey, <laughs> man, nice to talk with you again, bro. Absolutely. Casey, make sure you clip that, uh, that what the heck out of there. We'll use that. Down <laughs> more. But uh, it's good to see you, man. It's been a minute since we last spoke. It's been far too long, if you ask me. But listen, we have a date. We have a location. And you got your rematch with Davis and Figueredo. Life's pretty good, Brandon. I'm sure the excitement levels are through the roof right now. To, to be honest with you, I'm so tired right now because I finished my training. I'm so freaking tired. But yes, actually, yes, I'm so excited, you know. Uh, Glendale, Arizona, June 12th against this ugly guy, Davison. I'm ready. I'm ready to shock the world again. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Glendale, you get to do it in front of fans this time. Like the first fight would have been amazing if there were fans there, but you get them back for the rematch. How did you react to finding out that you'd be fighting in front of a crowd this time? Man, you know, it's a ingre ingredient extra to, to this fight. And actually I fall in, in not in, in, not in Glendale, but I fall in, in Phoenix, Arizona, like, uh, uh, Actually, I fought like three times in Phoenix and two times in Tucson, Arizona. So I, I have support there, you know. I, I was a champion in WFF, uh, a, a local promotion there. So I know the people there and, and, and I'm so excited to go again there and, and, and uh, share uh, my time and, and the octagon with this guy with, in front, all these guys from Arizona. So this is going to be like, in a weird way, like a hometown fight for you. Maybe, you know, obviously it's uh, was a, a long time ago. Uh, I think my last fight was in Tucson in 2016 before to go to the ultimate fighter. Uh, I, I fought there and defend my, my title in, in WFF. So, yeah, I'm excited to go, uh, go there again. On top of that, you get to share the card with Israel Adesanya, and I feel like there's a lot of common ground between the two of you guys. I feel like putting you two guys in a room would be a lot of fun, and he defends his title against <laughs> Marv Vittori. We also found out earlier this week, Leon Edwards and Nate Diaz will also take place on this card. So this is a big event, Brandon. Are, are you all, like, all in? Are you happy to be on this card, or is there a part of you that wishes that you and Davison were fighting in the main event? 
you need to forget uh, UFC 261. Forget that. UFC 253, the best event in th this year, I promise. <laughs> no, man, obviously, uh, yes, Israel is Sanja against Marvin Vettori. I'm excited for that fight, you know. I'm very, I'm a huge fan of both guys. Obviously, I love the work of Israel Sanja. And then the fight between uh, Leon Edwards and Nate Diaz, man, this car is, 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 is better every day. So you're saying it right now, UFC 263 will be better than UFC 261? Easily. Easily. <laughs> if that's the case, we are in for uh, for quite the treat on, on June 12th. And I know after the first fight, we, we spoke a couple days afterwards, and you wanted to take the family on vacation. You wanted to rest up a bit and spend some quality time with them before getting back into a training camp. Were you able to do that? Man, to be honest, uh, obviously I spent uh, some time with my family. Not really vacation because I don't. I don't. I feel like uh, I I have like unfinished business with this guy for, for the title. And uh, you know, I I feel like I need to finish this job first, and then I, I start to feel free to do something more. Obviously, yes, I spent time with my family. We went to some uh, some places, but yeah, I, I I promised to my family after this fight we need to go to some place. I don't know, like far you know i want to go to the to the to the flight to the airplane and fly like 10 hours i don't know you know How, how's the shoulder right now like i know you dealt with that late in the first fight you were basically fighting with one arm in that fifth round so how how, how did it heal up how long did it take for you to to get back to using it the way you wanted to no right now it's 100 percent it's it, right now my shoulder is amazing i after the fight uh, like in that in that week after the fight, uh, we went to the doctor and uh, she put some, like stem cells. I don't know what is in in Spanish, but I think for you it's very normal, like stem cells. I don't know what is that to be honest. But yeah, that helped me too much. Was very painful to be honest, but that, that helped that helped me. <laughs> You've known about this fight for a little while. I think it was late February when, when when the fight was confirmed and everyone started talking about it. And I know when we last spoke, you were hoping to get the rematch in March or April. Now it's happening June 12th. And you talked about the unfinished business. Are you happy with the timing of this fight? I mean, this is a mega card. You said it's gonna be better than 261, but like for you, do you wish it was happening sooner? Uh, I, actually, I, I wanted the, fi the fight in, uh, in the UFC uh, 261, and actually UFC offered the fight to uh, to the Figueroa and his team in that day, but he said no. He wanted to fight until June. Obviously, I understand he fought too much in in, two, in 2020. Maybe he needed some rest, or maybe he need to make a better plan for me now. So yeah, man, I, I'm. It's fine. It is what it is. Obviously, at the same time, I had more time to prepare for this fight. I, I have a better game plan, a better training camp. Um, just that uh, matters right now. Yeah, it's better than what? Two weeks? Two weeks for the last one? This is way better, right? Exactly. <laughs> more rest, I think so. <laughs> so I remember we spoke like when the fight was booked, you were like, I like this. I would, I, I like just getting right back after it. I don't have to like really cut a whole lot of weight. I don't, you know, I could just pretty much just do a couple of things and, and I'm right on target again. That, that was nice because I don't have any injury for the fight uh, against a uh, Roy Ball. My weight uh, was very light and I, I went to the fight. Uh, obviously, uh, light, the cutway was easy. Obviously, Everything comes with the the training camp, uh, uh, the the game plan against uh, against Figueiredo, but all that stuff with no injuries, with with my weight cut, all that was nice, but good. When did training camp actually start for you? Because like like we said, we knew about this fight for a while, but when did you actually like start training camp? Man, I'm st I'm start to training in in December. Uh, I I take a little rest like one and a half weeks because uh, I had like my, a lot of pain on all my body, my shoulder, obviously. But after that, I'm, st I'm start training, you know, obviously no like uh, uh, full training, but I'm start to make a, a game plan even in, in, in December. But my, my official 
a uh, training camp starts in uh, uh, March. Oh, I don't know why this just popped in my head, but I wanted to ask you. I, I saw a photo on your Instagram a few months ago. I, I don't know why this just recently popped into my brain, but it was you in front of this mural of you, like of you. And this is like massive image of your face and baby assassins written next to it. Like, how cool is that to, to see and take pictures in front of? Man, I think I'm, I'm a little bit famous here in my city. <laughs> You need to wait just a little bit more, and I can be a mayor here in my in, in in Tijuana. You never know. No, I don't. I don't like the government. <laughs> but man, it's 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 awesome. It's amazing. You know, all the uh, when the people recognize you and and try to make that kind of those kinds of of gifts is I, I I think so. Man, when I actually when I see. When I saw the the, the mural the, the first time, it was amazing. It was an amazing amazing experience. I'm very grateful with my city, and that's why I love this this place, you know, because it's it's amazing and the people uh, is amazing here. So that mural is in Tijuana, Mayor Moreno. Yeah, yeah it's it's very close uh, to the house of my parents uh, where I I I, I grew up. After I mean, after that first fight, I mean, it was universally praised. Everyone was talking about how good it was. In, in many people's eyes, it was the second, maybe the third best fight of 2020 behind Zhang Weili and Yuani and Jacek. How many times since the fight have you gone back and watched it? Um, so in that moment, I, I had a, a problem because I was living in Vegas. I, I, I got a, a, an Airbnb in Vegas in and at that moment, my uh, five pass UFC five pass account uh, um, was just for Mexico, so I can watch the fight in the United States. So I went, I went to my house here in Mexico and start to watch the fight. And man, I was very uh, uh, excited watching the fight. You know, obviously, yes. For me, the 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 fight of the year was obviously Joanna against uh, Sean Wei Lee, but man was very excited watching me fighting ag against this guy a tough guy obviously um it was impressive you know i'm very adorable i think so so you enjoyed your handiwork yep definitely <laughs> <laughs> so how many times have you watched did you watch it once or have you watched it multiple times nah, like too much at first just to watch you know but right now i'm watching the fight to try to to learn something more you know to watch some uh, uh pattern Pattern is the word, I think Pattern, so. Yeah. With uh, Figueiredo, you know, so I'm I'm working on that. So have you taken a lot away from it through the multiple watches? Definitely, yes. You know, actually, Fight Pass has the options to to put uh, the fight uh, sl slowly, slow. Slow motion. You know? uh, and you know, you can you can watch a little bit more some details up uh, between the fight. So yeah, I mean, I'm an. I'm an analyst too, you know, I'm part of the broadcast for UFC in Spanish, so I know uh, my job. I know my job and I, I enjoy, I'm enjoying uh, watching fights, so obviously more my fights. Yeah, we saw you, you were interviewing Ma Jorge Mazda before UFC 261, right? Man, I'm going for your job. <laughs> <You're going> for <the> <laughs> <laughs> Don't take my job, Brandon. Take, stick, yeah, have the UFC bring you on, don't take my job. <laughs> Uh, just kidding. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. After the fight, when we spoke, you know, we talked about Figueredo because he he spoke about being hospitalized before the fight that that he was very sick, and you didn't really buy that too much. You, you thought he was making excuses, and so I'm curious. Like five months later, after watching the fight, and the, you know that the time has healed the wound, so to speak. Do you still feel that way that he was making excuses? Man, yes, definitely. You know, uh, I, I went to the hospital uh, before a fight too, you know. It's not good, but it's normal. If you ask to some other fighters, they can uh, tell you the same. Some some guys uh, win, some guys lost, but it is what it is, you know. I, again, I went to the hospital too in, in other fights before the, before the fight, so... Man, the, the guy looks impressive. The guys look like uh, hard, you know, powerful. Uh, I understand. I understand every uh, everything around uh, Figueiredo is like, oh, this guy is powerful. This guy is amazing. This guy is a god. But 
some little skinny kid from Mexico comes and show you you're not a god, it's hard to 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 swallow, you know? Do you feel like you took a little bit away from him, sort of that mystique, so to speak? Yes, definitely. I mean, I right now my confidence is is here. It's very, very high. I need to be smart. I understand. And I, he's powerful. He's real. He's a real opponent. He's a real fighter. That's why he's a champion. But my confidence is very high. I know I can make some uh, really good damage in, in this next next fight against him. I, I can be more aggressive because all my game plan, you know, a uh, game plan for in two weeks was like, hey, be careful, uh, uh, take the advantage in the counters and uh, take care of his power. And that's it. But right now I feel his power. I know I can uh, support uh, the damage and I can be more aggressive. Because the sport evolves so much and things move so quickly, how different is the guy we're going to see on June 12th compared to the guy who fought Figueredo the first time in December? Obviously, um, everything is just uh, words, but you need to see the next Brandon Moreno. This next Brandon, actually, I'm, I'm trying to stay focused very in my in my in my conditioning. You know, I'm, I I want to be uh, stronger than ever. I want to be uh, uh, my car- with better cardio than ever. So you need to watch the next fight. Obviously, uh, I'm working in my body. I'm working in my conditioning too much. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people, the the reason a lot of people didn't give your fight fight of the year was because of that fifth round, because both of you obviously were super tired. You know, you were <laughs> yes. dealing with the shoulder and everything. So I, I, I assumed that you were going to put a lot of emphasis on your cardio for this fight camp. Yes, sir. No, yes. I, I obviously, yeah, I, I started the fifth round and, you know, the, the fourth round was a crazy round. But then we we went to the fifth round and uh, everything go uh, is, is slow more slow, yes. So yeah, I understand. So I'm working on that. I'm working in my conditioning. I I'm working in my power. I'm working and and be aggressive, I'll be aggressive from uh, first round to the fifth one. Everyone's looking at this fight like this is the great sequel to like a great film. Like they want to see the sequel. They want to see if it lives up to the first fight. My prediction is you're not looking for a great sequel. You're looking to do things a little bit differently. So h- how do you get this thing done on June 12th in the rematch? In 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 this kind of situations, some, some uh, the people maybe is is waiting for a trilogy, maybe you know. But I need to finish this rivalry with this guy. I need to finish this guy. I, I man. I want to be a champion. You know, I'm working so hard for this. I mean, I'm young. I I have 27 years old, but I have 10 years like a professional. I'm I have 15 years in this sport working so hard. Man, I'm, I'm just a uh, dream all day, all night, sorry, uh, in the in the bell ar- around my waist. Man, I'm just need to finish this guy. Does the vision look more clear now than it did in December? Of oh, man, of course, man. I, every single training, every single uh, sparring sessions, I can see how I can beat this guy. So, if you go out there and you finish this guy, and all goes according to plan, do you think there will be a trilogy fight, or do you think that this ends the rivalry altogether? Depends the way. Depends how I can finish this guy. You know, obviously, if the fight is so hard and. We we go to the fourth, fifth round, and uh, but I I get the knockout. Obviously, maybe the people want to see, want to see the 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 the, the third fight. But I, if I can finish this guy in the first one, in the second one, we can finish the rivalry right there. Yeah, because in a weird way, you could have like you could spend the next three fights with him. It's just. It's a weird situation because you fought to the draw the first time. So it's almost like we know the fight happened because it was awesome. But in a weird way, in the record books, it's like it didn't happen. We can fight five more times if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Best of seven? Seven, eight, even ten. I don't know. You never know. You guys just fight at each other every time. It's only going to get better and better. You know what I mean? Then you have to, and if you finish him the second round, you want to go back and you want to try to finish him in the first round. Why not? <laughs> Man, I, I, 
I'm so fired <laughs> up right now. Like I cannot wait for this fight, man. <laughs> what what a fight this is gonna be. The first one was amazing. And I am from a technical standpoint, I am so fascinated to see this rematch, especially in a full arena of screaming fans on June 12th, Brandon. I can't wait. You got I had goosebumps. See that? Goosebumps. That's what you gave me right there, Brandon. <laughs> oh man, I, I need to wait. Uh uh obviously in the first round uh, about his game game plan you know i don't know uh, what uh, he saw in the fight he can fix you know that's why uh, i told i tell you i need to be smart in, the, in that fight but i know my i know my my uh, personal goal in that fight so man i'm excited I'm ready. Actually, I mean, I'm so tired right now, but I know I, I'm ready to make an, a, a, a better fight even right now. We we need to wait a, a little bit more, you know, one more one more uh, month. But I, I'm working very hard, very hard uh, even right now. Oh, let me ask you, since you're trying to take my job, Brandon, what do you like in the uh, Michael Chandler, Charles Oliveira fight? Oh, man, hard question. You know, I'm impressive for the uh, for this uh, Charles Oliveira. You know, uh, this guy with better hands, with amazing submissions, and Michael Chandler, an explos- explosive uh, fighter. Uh, this is not for UFC. So amazing, uh, ex uh, former Bellator champion. Um, I need, I need, I want to see if uh, Charles Oliveira can can do something about the the ex- uh, explosion of Michael Chandler and his wrestling. You know, but uh, it's a fight I want I want to see definitely. Support for this episode comes from Locker Room, the app that's changing the way we talk sports. Locker Room is a sports fan's dream come true. It's a live audio platform that lets you connect with other fans, experts, and even the athletes themselves. Locker Room makes it easy to start your own conversations. Talk about the latest rumors, takes, news, and teams you care about most. Join massive watch parties for all of your friends to react together in real time as you celebrate a buzzer beater or suffer the agony of a crucial bricked free throw. And if you've got a bunch of supremely spicy takes you'd like to fire off, you're in luck. You can even record the conversations if you want and release them as a podcast. So it's time to start thinking about catchy titles. It's all totally free and available at the iOS App Store right now. So go download it today. Locker Room. Changing the way we talk sports. Support for this podcast comes from Invent Together. Let's talk about innovation in America. Did you know that patents are a major driver of job creation and economic growth? Problem is, not every American has the same opportunities when it comes to inventing and patenting. That's especially true for women and people of color. Even though women make up more than half the population, less than 13% of all inventors with a U.S. patent are women. Black and Hispanic college graduates patent at half the rate of their white counterparts. Invent Together is a coalition of organizations, companies, universities, and concerned citizens committed to ensuring that everyone can invent and patent. Because research shows that if more women and people of color patented their ideas, it could boost U.S. GDP by almost $1 trillion a year. What can you do to help diverse inventors patent and unleash economic opportunity? Find out at inventtogether.org. How can you not smile? After listening to that guy, even him saying he was coming for my job, I will never be mad at him. Even if he takes my job, I'm still not going to be mad at him. But very excited for that fight. Moreno challenging Davis and Figueredo for the 125-pound title coming up next month. That first fight was insane. Wrapped up the year. A lot of people had that number two, number three as the fight of the year in 2020. But that whole card is ridiculous right now. We got the two title fights. Both are rematches. We got... Israel Adesanya versus Marvin Vittori battling it out in the same arena that first fight happened, which is wild to think about for the middleweight title. We got the flyweight title fight. Now we got Leon Edwards versus Nate Diaz getting pushed to that card as well. It's a loaded up one. No doubt about that. The uh, the fans in Glendale, Arizona look like they're going to be in for a treat. So knock on wood, hopefully everything stays intact in the way it's supposed to be. It was a lot of fun on Saturday night for our next guest. Let's discuss that and much more with the great white himself, Alex Morono. 
All right, let us say hello to a big winner from this past Saturday night in Las Vegas. Stepped in on short notice to face Donald Cowboy Cerrone in the co-main event of UFC Vegas 26. And he picks up a huge win. First round TKO with a big flurry. Huge win for Alex Morono, who is kind enough to join us less than 48 hours later. Alex, how are you? Good, man. It's good to be back on the show. Absolutely. Congratulations on a huge win. This was some performance, especially on short notice. Opportunity knocked. You answered in a big way. How does it all feel less than 48 hours later? Man, it's, it's still kind of surreal. Uh, really best case scenario. I was talking to my uh, my striking coach, a guy named Matt Wall. He's been in my corner for every one of my fights since I was like 17. And uh, and we were just talking. I was kind of like a perfect storm of everything kind of working out the right way. And uh and it was just good, you know, getting the fight was, was awesome, but then winning the fight was, the, you know, the big goal, you know, it's kind of like a similar scenario, fighting Anthony Pettis, and, uh, and this time I had to make sure to make it work, and I did, it was cool, and there was a lot of really positive takeaways from that. This came together, obviously, very quickly after Diego Sanchez was released from the company last week, and I know Cowboy kind of had a list of names to, to sort of veer through, and not sure how it landed on you getting the shot. So I'm curious how this all happened. Like, when did you find out this was a thing and that you had the chance to fight Donald, Donald Cerrone in a co main event? Yeah, honestly, I'd be curious to understand like the logistics behind it as well. Like, you know, I'm curious what if there were other names out there and, 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 and who those guys were. And, uh, and yeah, so it was cool. So uh, Wednesday, on, I won't forget Wednesday, right around noon. Is when, uh, is when I think the news broke that Diego was released. And one of my best friends from back from high school, he's the one who actually got me into MMA way back in the day, had sent me a text. And just as soon as I saw my phone, I saw and I called my coach before I could even respond. And I was like, coach, you know, Sanchez is out. Uh, let the guys know, let the UFC know that I, I would take this fight. And my coach was like, Morono, are, are, are you sure? Like, are you in good enough shape? And, uh, and, you know, Cerrone's going to be fired up and ready for this fight because he was going to fight Diego. And, like, especially a fight he knows he can win, he, uh, he would train hard for him. Like, you know, there was a couple of videos of him training. And I was like, Coach, trust me, I can do this. And, and then Safe, and Coach Safe was like, all right, Moreno, I'm gonna, I'll trust you. I'll let him know. And it was cool. Just like, so then I'm already, I already have a little pressure going into this because if I did get the fight and, and lose, uh, Coach would never have let me, you know, hear the end of it. <laughs> So, uh, so we let him know Wednesday, uh, and we get like a thumbs up, like, okay, cool. We, we got the information. And so I kind of assume I'm fighting just in case. So I'm already, I'm already training super hard. So I didn't like train much harder, but I started doing things stylistically a little bit different. Um, you know, so usually when I'm not in camp, if I'm training with guys, I'll try to like emulate their opponents as much as possible. I stopped doing that and I started working on what I'm good at, you know, so I train, you know, a little bit on the week, you know, normal, but I don't really hear anything back. And Saturday is one of our hardest training days at my gym. We grapple for an hour and a half really hard, nothing but live rounds, and then we do MMA sparring. But that Saturday, we had a really big local tournament, the grappling games, and I had over 80 people from my gym signed up, which is outrageous. The most I've ever had before was like 40, and we doubled that. It was about 50 kids and 30 adults. And, man, we, we crushed at the tournament. So all day Saturday, probably from like 9 a.m. to about 6 p.m., I'm, I'm coaching – and I still don't hear anything. So I'm like, all right, the fight's probably not going to go down. So, you know, I come home, eat finally, and, uh, and uh, so I'm playing Warzone, and it's about 1230, and I get a call from Coach Safe, which is super unorthodox. It's really late. And I'm like, as soon as I see my phone light up and I see it's Coach, you know, calling, I'm like, oh, shit, this fight's going down. So I answer, and Coach is like, hey, you know, I hope, I hope you didn't do anything weird because it's looking good. We still got it. We didn't get a hard yes, but I think it took a few days for Cerrone to deliberate about what he was going to do. I don't know if he chose of the list or, or the UFC chose, or he was just like telling him he was down to fight. And then Sunday is when I get like the official, the fight is on. So, you know, I try to train pretty good Sunday. I had to call a few guys just to get some rounds in. And then, uh, then I train really hard Sunday or Monday. I do like several three, five minute round sessions, like three, five strength conditioning, three, five super hard no gi, three, five in the May. I take a break. I come back in the evening and I do a bunch of kickboxing rounds. I honestly felt great. Like all my, all my fresh, you know, uh, teammates were kind of getting tired because I was just really trying to put a pace on them. And, uh, and, and man, it was just, it was cool. It was all so sudden. I almost prefer you know, like a two or three week notice camp if I'm already in shape because there's, there's less stress. There's way less wear and tear on the body. 
Um, and then especially, you know, the fight ended right at the end of the first round. And, like, I'm never tired at the end of the first round, but I'm starting to feel the fight fatigue. And I felt maybe better at the end of that fight than, than other fights where I had full fight camps. So, I mean, I'm probably going to end up doing this more often. Maybe not taking such short-notice fights, but not, like, hitting the really, really hard aspects of fight camp until maybe, like, three weeks out. Because I'm always training, so it's not like I'm ever out of shape. Yeah, because this is the second time in a row you essentially had short notice fights. You basically just went in there and, and fought. I know Pettis was a little bit longer in terms of like the notice, but and then it ended up being the final fight of Pettis's run in the UFC. I mean, that, that that fight didn't go your way, but you know, for them to come back your way and and go with you for this opportunity against another legend of the sport, the obvious the UFC obviously sees something in you. So that had to make you feel pretty good despite coming off the, off of the loss, did it not? Yeah, I've always been super grateful. The UFC has given me a, a lot of opportunities. Uh, granted, I got a decent winning record. I'm eight and four with one no contest, which isn't bad. Uh, but even like when I was on the undercard, I would often be like the featured prelim. I was the pre featured prelim for like maybe four or five fights, and they, they always gave me opportunities. Now, now to be fair, uh, my debut was taken on short notice when I fought Josh Berkman. Uh, that fight was put together pretty short notice, and what people don't know. Is my first contract, I went two wins and two losses. Well, one of those losses got overturned to a no contest, but it doesn't matter. And I did not immediately get re-signed. And, like, that, well, I was sort of in limbo. So they actually offered me uh, Bobby Nash in China on, like, two weeks' notice, and I took it. But uh, the visa didn't work out. And then they offered me Diego Lima in, I think, North Carolina in January of 2016, maybe 2017. I forget. But I took it as well, and then Lima's the one who turned down the matchup because he didn't want a short notice opponent change. So, like the fact that I had taken two pretty, you know, risky fights on short notice, then there Sean Shelby was like, "Hey, thanks for helping out. We'll get you that fight in Austin." So that's when that Berkman fight came to be. And uh, and then you know I had two fights in Houston in my hometown with super favorable matchups, one against Sheldon Westcott, who I would have freaking blazed through. And uh, I don't know what happened. He just, he just doesn't really fight anymore. He was one of the least active fighters on the roster. But then I got a random young Nico Price, which was hard to deal with. And then uh, and then I fought again in Houston against Diego Lima, and he pulled out. He had to get neck surgery. That was legit. And then I got a very unknown chaos. So I've never turned anything down. I've always really tried to show them that I'm like down to, to work with them and, and, and fight for them. And I think they know that and appreciate that. Plus, I know they like my style of fighting. I usually won't go in for takedowns or try to clinch or, or do much. I usually stand there and trade. So I know they like that. I know the fans like that. Most importantly, I enjoy doing that. So it all works out. What did you make of this whole Diego Sanchez release? Like everything going on with him, the, the, the coach being such a prevalent part of his story, Joshua Fabia, the bizarre training videos that were leaked. Like what have you made of this whole situation? Like obviously it led to a good thing for you, but you know, just outside looking in, what have you thought of all of this? It's weird. You know, I got a, a cool black belt coach in my gym, a guy named Joel, real serious, really good student. And uh, he actually bought a school of self-awareness T-shirt just kind of as a joke. But I always wanted to fight Diego because he was like one of my favorite fighters. And he would like run to the middle of the octagon and just start throwing down. And I always wanted to fight him for that. But then when he got this weird coach, I, I kind of wanted to fight him to, to let his coach know that he's that's just wrong what they're doing. It makes me feel bad for Diego. Like, genuinely, I, I still like Diego, especially like watching his interviews. He's, he seems like a sweet guy, and he just seems like he's being led astray. And it's one of those things where everyone around him is like, hey, this guy's bad news. You need to get away from him. And, and you can just, you know, that guy's in his ear telling him they're all wrong. I'm here to protect you. But, dude, this stuff is weird. It's the weirdest coaching I think anyone has ever seen kind of at this level that's gotten this kind of spotlight. I'm sure you watched the videos of him kind of going off on Paul Felder. And Megan Olivi, it was funny watching Paul Felder bite his tongue for a few minutes and then <laughs> tell him to go F off. But uh, <laughs> even when Stefan Bonner was filming it, you can tell Stefan Bonner's like, oh, this is weird. But it's just it's just weird. I mean, weird's a good word for it. And uh, and sad is another good descriptive word for it. And it's it's strange. And and and, and you know, and really if we really break it down, like I can thank Fabia's weirdness for getting me this fight and opportunity and and you know, this has been by far the biggest thing I've ever done in the UFC. It's just crazy how you know, the butterfly effect works. And it's just, it's still wild and I'm still kind of absorbing it all. 
how was the weight cut on this for such a short notice fight? Like you ended up making it, but was it, was it miserable or because you, you're always training and you're always in really good shape. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. No, that was one of the biggest factors I, uh, I've been doing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I say, I don't know why I've been doing a lot of rounds of training and like when I, I spar quite a bit, but I, I never really spar that hard. And like when I spar, my primary goal is to be defensive in terms of not absorbing shots to my head. I can tell you, I've been doing this for like 14 years. I, I can count on two hands the amount of times I've had like a headache after sparring. Very, very rare. I really try to be defensively sound. And uh, and just so I'll give you a rundown. So on Tuesday, I, I drove to Fortis just to train, which was great. I did an hour of gi jiu-jitsu. I did an hour of no gi then we did an hour of five minute rounds. I mean, I must have, I don't know how many rounds I did. And then after the hour I had stayed after and I had given some guys like their hard rounds. So I had done several rounds of sparring. Then on Thursday, I went to a war and trained with Trevor Giles and did like 10 rounds of MMA sparring, just for fun, five bigs and five littles. And then I met up with one of my guys who I do boxing with. I did five threes of boxing. And then that evening I did five fives in MMA prepping one of my guys for a title fight. So when like in one day alone, I had done almost 20 rounds of sparring. So the weight was good. So that Saturday night, as soon as I got the call from coach, I went and weighed myself and I was 188 pounds, which is a pretty average for like not in fight camp. When I'm in camp, I try to be right about 185 and I try to stay there so I can keep durability. And uh, Sunday I did a 24 hour fast. Monday I trained really hard and ate super clean. And then I left for Vegas right around 184 which is a pretty average weight cut. The morning of the, the fight, or the morning of weigh-ins, I should say, I just sweat about five pounds out, which which wasn't bad. I, I can I can sweat that off really easy. It felt good. It was a it was like a, it was like a one pound above average weight cut, and I made it easy. I almost kind of prefer it because I rehydrated really well. And uh, if you guys don't know, the UFC PI is there, and they actually like supply meals for us and give us like a rehydration process. And I followed everything to a T and felt better than ever. That's good to hear. Um, you know, heading into the fight and with Cowboy, and he touched on this at the media day, he's touched on it in, in many interviews leading into the fight. He's not a fast starter. That first round is, is always pretty tough on him because he needs those first five minutes or so to get going. And I'm sure you were very well aware of that, especially since this is a fight that came together very quickly. Was it important for you to really get after him in that first round, put the pressure on him, try to get him out of there quick. You know, it, it, yes, but but not focused in that way specifically. I couldn't just like get there and start to flurry because I didn't want to gas. Like the last thing I wanted to do was gas. And I know he had just trained really hard for that. I think it was submission underground, but his match against Rafael Dos Anjos. So like I know his wrestling and grappling pacing was really strong. And, like what I what I could not have allowed was to get taken down and held down. So I didn't want to risk, you know, stepping in too much. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to keep breaking his rhythm. I know Muay Thai guys need to find rhythm. And like, if you watch his fight against Ali Aquinta, one of my favorite cowboy moments, because he was an underdog in that fight. And uh, he just took it to him five fives with such beautiful striking. But I tried to really break his rhythm. So a lot of side to side movements, and I tried to really hit a lot of fakes and feints and, and, and not be predictable when I was going to enter and then turn really fast. And most importantly, when he came in, I had to, like, keep a tight guard and come in myself. So breaking his rhythm in the beginning was what I believed was most important. And I think I did that to perfection. That was maybe my best performance in the octagon. And I'll tell you, I felt so comfortable. I kept visualizing the walkout. I knew I was going to be walking out first. And it's just such a consistent feeling being inside the octagon. Like the canvas is very rough and the mats are very soft. They almost feel like gel and the lights are very hot. There's no other feeling like being in the octagon than being in the octagon. So I tried to really put myself in that position and, and visualize seeing them across mean mugging me, which he was, which was cool. Hearing the cowboy song was also cool. But uh, I just felt so very comfortable. And like in, in the fights and training, it's not the same because it's not so violent or volatile. But like in the fights, it feels like the striking exchanges is a bunch of collisions. And I feel like I've gotten really good at timing those collisions and then moving my head off so I'm not getting collided on in the face. 
and, you know, trying to keep it elsewhere. And uh, so, man, it just worked out so well. I felt so comfortable. I love being in the octagon. I got two, I got two plus hours in there already. So I hope to like double that time eventually. Yeah, you, you you landed that sort of like duck under counter right hand over the top. It was beautiful. I mean, it was like a it was just a beautiful shot. You had him badly hurt. You came in hard, but then it seemed kind of going by what you were saying before. It seemed like you backed off a tad. Like you became patient in the approach. Like rather than just flurry in and just release everything you looked for openings that's where you landed that big body shot and then you went on to finish the fight like it was a blitz for sure but there were so i'm curious like was there some inner dialogue with yourself when you said like you know this dude's hurt but he's super durable don't blow out all your energy in this flurry let's be smart about this yeah yeah i was telling myself i was like pick your shots because i had i had hurt him initially and then i had just like i'd flurried hard and a lot of the shots were starting to win so then, like, I took a step back, and that's when I threw that really hard shot to the body. I've been practicing that a lot, especially, like, because I know I spam right hands to the head a bunch in fights, and I'll get guys to block high. And uh, so I timed that one well and hit a hard body shot, which got him to kind of curl in. And I've been working a lot of really tight rear uppercuts. I feel like guys in MMA throw really wide rear uppercuts, so I've been really practicing, like, throwing it from my, like, brow and, like, moving my whole body with the shot and releasing it a lot later. And, uh, and then, yeah, and I just, I, I didn't want to waste a bunch of shots and let him recover by like hitting over the top of his guard. So I just tried to be accurate. And, uh, and, and yeah, after the first floor, I was like, all right, pick your shots, but stay on them without, without covering too much distance. And, uh, and I feel like I did that really well. Are you like Mark Goddard? Come on, let's go pull me off. Let's, let's end this thing. I'm glad Goddard stopped it when he did, uh, cause he was covering and like, I think had, those uppercuts that got the finish, they weren't really getting through flush. But I know his 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 defense got really narrow, and uh, and I had actually been working spinning elbows after watching Yuri hit him. So I think that's what would have come very shortly after. And uh, and it's cool because you know like the, the TKO was as legit as they get, but there wasn't that much damage. Like, I don't think his nose is broken, is bleeding, but not broken. And the shots were kind of hitting him in like the ear and temple and chin. Nothing too crazy. And uh, and I wasn't really thinking about this before the fight, but especially after, I'm just glad there was no damage. And, and you know, I'm pretty sure he'll be healed up in a week or two and be able to get back to it, back to doing what he do- likes. And uh, not that I didn't want to hurt him. That's not, I'm trying, you know, if you're fighting someone, you better try to hurt him. That's the goal. But I'm just glad neither of us got, like, truly damaged. That, that was, that's, that's always good to see, especially after, you know, Dominic Reyes, what a fight. I got to say, man, I, I've always enjoyed watching him fight. That year he is fun to watch. Like a broken orbital, man, that's just tough. You know, like it sucks. If you, if you feel like get damaged with a victory, it's worth it. But if you get something broken with a loss, it like compounds the, the like the, 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 the toughness factor, like the difficulty factor. And again, I'm just, I'm glad Cal was okay after that fight. And as if the night couldn't have gone any better for you, you got yourself an extra 50 G's. This, this is your first bonus. Like you've, you've gotten a fight of the night before, but this is your first performance bonus, wasn't it? It is. And my fight of the night got heavily taxed in China. So like in that fight, I made right at a hundred grand. I got like 25 to show, 25 to win and then fight of the night. And they took about 40% off the top. It was, that was a hard stomach. So, I mean, I got the bonus, but, like, the bonus effectively mitigated the taxes that would have gone to the fight and show in. So this was, like, my first true untouched bonus. Now, granted, I know I got to pay taxes here, which is cool. But, uh, but I mean, I, I, I made a big chunk of change. That was a six-figure overhand right. So, like, I'm getting paid. I'm going to definitely pay my coaches out. That was cool. There you go. And there's a... Uh... There's a lot of talk about Cerrone's career veering towards the end of the line. And I know Dana White has said in the past that he may need to have, quote unquote, that conversation with Donald about stepping away. While I feel like that day is coming, I also feel like he's not in the same boat as a lot of these guys. Like Donald just likes fighting. Like it's a thrill seeking thing for him. Like he doesn't have to fight. He just likes fighting. So I feel like the UFC will probably give him another chance. Do you think he fights again? Man, I hope. I hope he fights again. Uh, I'll tell you, I can't imagine him at 155. I know he's a bit leaner, but he was a fair-sized welterweight. I remember looking across the cage from him, and I was like, huh, doesn't look like a 55er. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's definitely game. Like, you can, 
you can see it. I could see it in his eyes when when we were exchanging. Like when I would land a punch, he like would double down and kind of grimace back. And uh, and, and yeah, I hope he drops down to fifty five. I'm sure he will. And I, it would be cool. Like I know Miller and Guida drop down to forty five. If I'm not mistaken. Um, but like Lozon, I hope they give him a veteran. You know, uh, you know, I just hope they give him another vet. And uh, it'd be cool to see him do at least one more. And so long as he's not getting like put to sleep, like even his McGregor knockout, even his Gaethje knockout, he wasn't like unconscious. He got hit and stunned and kind of like fell or blocked, even kind of like he did against me. But those, I know those don't take a huge toll. And like his fight with Nico was competitive. His fight with Pettis was competitive. I mean, I always enjoy watching Cowboy fight. If that wasn't me fighting him, I would have definitely been tuning into that card. Granted, I had two teammates fighting, so I'd have watched it no matter what. But I would have certainly stayed and watched that Cowboy fight. Like he, uh, he's the man. I, I, I'm excited to see what he does next. Yeah, I actually we do a matchmaking show on the uh, for the site, and I said if Don's gonna do one more, let's run it back with Miller because he's got the win. He's got the win over Jim, and that fight was seven years ago. And if he's gonna go to 55, Jim it doesn't strike me. Jim's not a guy that's gonna knock him unconscious. It's just gonna be a fun fight between those two guys. The scrambles would be fun. I just feel like it would be a good, you know, a good story and a good like last fight to fight a guy like Jim one more time, just because he's got that confidence already. Yeah, also Joe Lozon would be cool. Plus, Miller and uh, Cerrone have a tie for the most appearances in the UFC. I think it's like 38 or 39, which is cool. <laughs> I don't know if I'll make it.